So uh, as most of you know, I'm Dominic. I'm going to be talking about what band limitation, wavelets, and scaled QFT. I'm from RMIT, of course. Uh, so first, I just want to talk a little bit about the motivation for band limited quantum field theory. <clears throat> uh, from quantum gravity, uh, we have this idea of this maximum resolu resolution for space-time measurement, uh, where if we combine Einstein's equations and the uncertainty principle, we get this idea that there's only a finite maximum resolution um, to which you can measure space-time distances before curvature, curvature uncertainty makes it unable for you to resolve anything. Uh, also, we have things like black hole thermodynamics, Hawking radiation, and von Neumann entropy that predict a similar thing where you get this discretization of space-time from ultraviolet cutoffs of quantum fields around black holes. And that's something from QFT as well. We have UV cutoffs and renormalization which often are removed later after some calculations, but perhaps we don't need to. Again, we have black hole thermodynamics from Hawking radiation. So this idea is that we have all of these things in uh, modern physics that promote this idea to a, of a minimum length scale to the universe, where uh, different things have this idea that even though we treat our universe as continuous, there might be this finite scale at which everything sort of becomes discrete at the bottom. And band limitation is a process or a method that allows us to consider continuous theories that still possess such minimum length scale. So I want to talk a little bit about band limited signals for a moment. These are functions with limited frequency support. Um, so it's Fourier transform, even though it's over all of the reals, can be equivalently expressed over some finite bandwidth. In this case, I use minus omega to omega, where omega is what we call it an ultraviolet cutoff. Uh, I said a little bit about this at RQI South, so maybe some of you will be a bit familiar. But <clears throat> we have for now no infrared cutoff, just an ultraviolet cutoff at omega. So the Fourier domain, um, Fourier domain is, ba is bounded. For such a band limited function, we can write <clears throat> or we can reconstruct a continuous function, the continuous function f, from a countably infinite set of its samples, provided that set is sufficiently dense. So it's from a lattice that has a finite, has a small enough spacing. We use this uh, reconstruction formula called Shannon sampling theorem, where we interpolate the samples using a sink function of sufficient uh, spacing delta x. So we have a lattice of spacing delta x, which is given by UV cutoff, pi on omega. And this determines the, the minimum length scale of our lattice and eventually our universe. Uh, <clears throat> additionally, you can also start with a discrete signal and interpolate it into a continuous one. So you start with discrete samples, you interpolate it into a continuous one, you don't have to start from continuous and sample down. Uh, such a thing is actually commonly done in animation where you might have a, uh, a low frame rate animation. So often sometimes I might be at 16 frames per second or 30, and then you interpolate that into a continuum, maybe not using sync functions to reconstruct, but another interpolation function to reconstruction. And then you sample back down at a higher frame rate. So that's how often sometimes 30 FPS animations are upscaled to 60 FPS. So with band limitation, we can take a continuous function and discrete function and make them equivalent. We can, we can treat them as perfectly equivalent things. And because they're perfectly equivalent and through Shannon sampling reconstruction, these continuous functions that have fundamentally continuous uh, properties must also have equivalent discrete representations. These continuous you know, properties such as derivatives, integrals, things of calculus. So starting with the reconstruction formula where I've just labeled this S omega as our sink function. So omega is again, the ultraviolet cutoff, delta X is the lattice spacing. We can, we can see there's an implication that the derivative of a band limited function can be constructed from the sum of the function samples multiplied by the derivative of the sink function, because you just move the derivative onto the continuous part of the right hand side of the equation. So at some point on the sampling lattice, this gives you this <clears throat> equation that tells us that the derivative of some band limited function evaluated on its lattice sites is equal to the linear combination of the rest of its samples with some coefficients d uh, given by the equation on the bottom right. So we can see that this, this d sub hj for the nth derivative is equal to the overlap of the nth derivative of the sink function with the sink function itself. 
And this is equivalent to evaluating this derivative of the sinc function on the lattice spacing. <clears throat> uh, continuing this, we have this equation for the derivatives for band limited functions. And we can see that the derivatives of the function are, we can, are computed by taking the linear combination of its samples, almost like it's a finite difference calculation, but it's using all of the samples on the lattice of you know, countably infinite size, not just a few of them. And it's important to note that this is a perfect equivalence. We can reinterpolate these samples to give a continuous representation of this derivative. And we end up with this double sum over both H and J for these coefficients D and values of the, of the <clears throat> function on the lattice with some sync function interpolation. And again, these are what the values of D are. For, <clears throat> uh, you know, we can compute these, uh, these values and for a band limited, yeah, we, as I've said, it's a linear combination of function samples. These coefficients are given by this. And for specific cases, let's say for the first derivative, we can calculate what those are. It gets a little bit more complicated for higher derivatives, but for the first and second, we can calculate what these are. And for the first derivative, we have this uh, non-local coupling between, yeah, between lattice sites, where we have this polynomially decaying function for D at separations um, between H and J. Uh, we can do the same thing for the second derivative. We see a plot of it on the right. Uh, we can say that these are non-local and they also have alternating sign and they're now non-zero at the origin from this pi squared on three. So <clears throat> the second derivative of a function or a band limited function can be given by this infinite sum of its samples multiplied by these coefficients. So <clears throat> along with derivatives, we also have uh, inner products that are usually continuous quantities, but for band limited signals have a equivalent discrete counterpart. We can calculate what this is by first integrating over the overlap of sync functions. And we find that these, this integration for if these sync functions are displaced by integer multiples of our lattice spacing, we get a chronic delta. And that means that the overlap, the overlap of sigma functions is a chronic delta function, and these are orthogonal functions. <clears throat> Consequently, if we want to calculate the overlap of two band limited functions with, when they have the same UV cutoff, the integral of this will be equal to a Riemann sum of the product of their samples. So now we have this equivalence between the integration of the product of two functions and an infinite sum of the two. Now we can note that as delta x is the lattice spacing, this is literally a Riemann sum without taking the limit as delta x goes to zero. So <clears throat> now we can move on to doing band limited quantum field theory because we have all of these tools that I just set out and we can consider first the free Klein Gordon field in one dimension. It's a simple case, we like to use it. So again, it's just you know written as this linear combination of creation and annihilation operators <clears throat> where if it's non-band limited, the momenta of these A's and A daggers can run from minus K, uh, from minus infinity to all the way to up to infinity. And they satisfy our usual commutation relations of QFT, where <clears throat> AK and AK clamp dagger uh, commute to a delta function and the rest just commute to zero. We can define the non-covariantly band limited field. Uh, note that I said non-covariant because if we introduce an ultraviolet cutoff to our field, it loses its general covariance. <clears throat> However, if we were to do that, all we see is that the creation and annihilation operators themselves aren't changed. The only thing that is affected is the, uh, the, range of, the range of K over which they can exist. So you can only create particles and annihilate particles up to a certain maximum momentum. Uh, consequently, the commutation relation becomes a sinc function as opposed to a uh, Dirac delta. But if we were to take the limit of omega going to infinity, we would recover that Dirac delta commutator. However, if we don't do that, we would just, for instance, just plot this, we can see that these, this correlation, or this commutation relation is non-zero for longer ranges of for large just for displacements of X and Y um, for you know, real displacements. But on integer multiples of delta X, so at, at the lattice spacing, these are all, these all become zeros. There's no commutation at lattice spacings or we get a chronic delta relationship. So if we consider only the lattice sites of the field, so the, the samples of the field at the at lattice spacing delta X determined by the UV cutoff, we get a 
a local theory once again, or lo at least local computational relations. So <clears throat> we can now move on to the Hamiltonian. In one dimension, the, we have a free Klein Gordon Hamiltonian, which is given by this. It's a standard, um, you know, the conjugate momentum of the field plus the mass term and then plus the coupling term that uh, gives us our wave like behavior. However, if we were to consider only the band limited fields, we could promote this, or I guess demote this to a band limited Klein Gordon Hamiltonian, which simply only takes into account the band limited components of our field. And all I've really done is just add the superscript omega to each of the field components. However, we can notice that this is just the integral over the products of band limited functions where you know these are operator valued functions, but they're still functions of X of position. And also we're dealing with these derivatives of band limited functions, which we have discrete representations of. So that means we can write a perfectly discrete representation of our band limited Klein Gordon Hamiltonian using our band limited techniques. So we have a band limited derivative and has an equivalent discrete counterpart the inner product, which also has an equivalent discrete counterpart. Combining these gives us a discrete model that is, has perfect equivalence to the continuous representation of our band limited Klein Gordon field. And so this uh, with non local coupling given by this D. <clears throat> that means our continuous theory has an equivalent lattice model. So we can treat it as a lattice model with harmonic oscillators, right? So each ball represents a harmonic oscillator. Each spring represents some coupling between the oscillators. Note that these aren't just regular springs, they're kind of like magic springs that actually couple every oscillator to every other oscillator in our lattice in one dimension. So it's not local, it's not even nearest neighbor. It's given by this D derivative, which decays uh, quadratically, it decays polynomially. And so it's not, it's not local, but it means that every other uh, every other oscillator is connected to each other one, we still have a lattice model, it's just non-local. So <clears throat> we can see that if we have a continuous Hamiltonian, we can write it as an equivalent discrete one. And the, <clears throat> the upshot is that every band limited continuous quantum field has an equivalent non-local lattice theory. So <clears throat> the question then is, what happens if we don't really care about band limited fields? Can we extend this to non band limited ones? How can we write a lattice model for a non band limited field, one whose Fourier domain is still not bounded by anything? How can, and additionally, how can we leverage what we know about, the, about band limited models to maybe write something like this? Well, the answer is yes, we can. And how do we do it? We use what's called Shannon wavelets. And here's a uh, picture of me changing what I'm looking at at the moment. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Shannon wavelets. In image processing, Shannon wavelets are used to decompose an image into different resolutions. So we might have a, we have a low, me low, medium, and higher, even anything in between resolution components of an image. So you'd, you know, you'd have your coarse graining, your fine graining, and your medium graining of your image, and you decompose into all of these different pictures and then if you want to combine them later to reproduce the original image, you can. In signal processing, we do basically the same thing, but to a signal with different frequency regions. And this is the same as this coarse grain, fine grain. And so if you were to consider a just random signal, you could decompose it into its low, medium, and high frequency components. <clears throat> and later, if you wanted to, you could put them all back together to reconstruct the original signal. Uh, if we we're going to do that for more than just three frequency regions, it might look something like this, where <clears throat> we decompose a frequency domain into a what we call a center band and an infinite number of outer bands. So this first term in uh, this equation is a top hat function, and it tells us it gives us literally just a band in the center with with two omega. It's at minus omega to positive omega. These other terms in this infinite sum are extra bands, what we call like the wavelet components of the Fourier domain that give us these, um, these what's it called, these new bands that go from uh, two to the n plus one omega to two to the n omega. And so now omega is no longer a UV cutoff, it just sets the size of each band. So it sets our scale for these functions. 
if we were to add all these bands together, as I said, we would reconstruct the full Fourier domain and <clears throat> there's without any overlap of the band, they just all sit next to each other and generate the one function. So it turns out that, you know, if you add the first top hat plus the infinite sum of all of the other top hats that are all scaled and displaced, you're just gonna reconstruct the, the constant function at, at one height. And so you can just do that and decompose any, for any frequency or any function into this decomposition. <clears throat> And again, the, the width of these bands increase for higher and at uh, each scale, these widths increase. <clears throat> so I want you to consider a function for now whose Fourier domain is only non-zero within two bands. So within for one given n, for some given n, we have our uh, g of x whose Fourier domain is non-zero only within those bands. So if we could consider it to be have an ultraviolet cutoff at two to the n plus one omega and an infrared cutoff at two to the n omega. <clears throat> Such a function has a reconstruction formula like the Shannon reconstruction formula. <clears throat> and it's given by this. And one might notice that this is a, it's the, the continuous function is equal to an infinite sum of its samples multiplied by some interpolation function, which is now a difference between two sync functions. One sync function is scaled by two to the n times omega, and the other is scaled by two to the n plus one times omega. Again, delta x is just the ratio of pi and omega. So it's set by the scale set of omega. It's no longer going to be cut off, but it still sets the scale of our lattices. But we just we label uh, psi this Shannon wavelet, and we can again notice that. This is very analogous to just regular Shannon reconstruction for band limited fields. Because again, this G is still band limited. It's just got an ultraviolet, it's got an infrared cutoff as well as an ultraviolet one. <clears throat> so we do Shannon reconstruction, Shannon wavelet reconstruction with it. <clears throat> These coefficients G sub J, they're given by the values of the function on a lattice, not just of spacing delta X, but of spacing two to the negative N delta X. So for higher Ns, the lattice spacing is smaller and smaller. Uh, you could consider this to be like you're actually increasing the UV cutoff at higher scales or higher ends. And as a result, the corresponding lattice spacing is smaller. <clears throat> this is equivalent to the overlap of the function with the wavelet itself. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> as I said, these samples are, are the values of G on the lattice. And that means we have a sampling theory for what I'm just going to call banded functions because they're given by bands. They're also band limited, but I'm going to call them banded because they have an infra infrared cutoff as well as an ultraviolet one. <clears throat> now, what happens if we take all of these Gs, different ends, and we just put them all together? So consider a function that is neither banded nor band limited. It's just completely, it's full Fourier domain is supported. It's non-zero uh, wherever it wants to be. <clears throat> We can decompose its Fourier domain into bands, and we can write it as an as a sum of an omega band limited component of the function f at the bottom, plus an infinite sum over all ends from zero to infinity of the wavelet components of the function, the banded ones. So we've written it. Uh, we've just decomposed its Fourier domain into different components. Each one is band limited on its own, but the whole thing together isn't. So we have a band limited component and we have the scaled wavelet components. <clears throat> Each of these, as we know, as we just showed, has a sampling theory. So if we were to take the scale decomposition of a function, so you decompose it into its band limited and its wavelet components, and we note that each one has a sampling theory individually, where the one on the left is the band limited component, the Interpolation function are our sinks with scaled by omega, and the scale, the other components, f, n, are um, the samples of the component of the function that is band limit, that is uh, banded at that scale multiplied by the wavelet as the interpolation function. We can create a generalized sampling theory for a non band limited function, f, <clears throat> that is a fully continuous representation of the function equivalent to a, I guess, an infinite sum of discrete representations on differently scaled lattices. 
Uh, some things to note about this is that the wavelets themselves are orthogonal in both scale and displacement, and they also have no overlap with the sink function. So that means that we get a Kronecker delta for different scales, different wavelets, and Kronecker deltas at different positions. And thus, from our uh, generalized rigid structure formula for non bandle moving functions, each component to each term, so f omega sub j or fn sub k, gives unique information about the full function. So if you want to do a fully continuous reconstruction of f without there being any approximation or any loss of information, you need to include every term from all of these sums. <clears throat> However, once you have that, you can do everything you did with band limited functions and you can write things like derivatives and portions of calculus to do proper, uh, you know, to take continuous properties of our function and write equivalent discrete representations. So <clears throat> the derivative following a similar method that we use for the sample, for Shannon sampling, we just, we just move the derivative on F onto the derivatives of the interpolation functions. So the ELF derivative of some function F is given by this, where on the left, we have our band limited derivative with our Ds, our capital, our capital D that tell us the, <clears throat> the coupling between different, different sinks. But we also have our wavelet derivative where these gammas tell us the coupling between different wavelets. And this tells us that these are the coefficients that we need when we write linear combinations of our uh, functions at each scale to produce the <clears throat> to produce the derivative of the function. So the gammas are given by this overlap between the derivative of the wavelet uh, and the wavelet itself at different scales and different positions. So with that, we can see that. <clears throat> Uh, the derivative of the function is a given by a linear combination of the band limited components of the function on some lattice plus an infinite sum of the linear combinations of the scaled function values on other lattices. So our full derivative is equal to basically this infinite sum of other linear combinations of the components of the function on different lattices. And <clears throat> The first derivative, these components are given by this, where again, we have uh, linear decay, non-local decay of the coefficients, but still linear. And for the second derivative, we have quadratic or polynomial decay of these components. Uh, Dominic, non yes. can I ask you a quick question? Yep. Um, if you go back to the previous slide, um, why is it only gamma and n? Why is it only the diagonal terms? Uh, that's actually really important. Uh, when, something that I was going to mention in a bit, but I can tell you now, what you might be able to notice is in the bottom left, gamma JH1 and M has a Kronecker delta in N and M. In it. And it turns out that for the Shannon wavelet, these gammas always have a Kronecker delta uh, out the front for when you calculate them for any, <clears throat> any derivatives, any else derivative. The result of that means that you only ever have to consider the n n components of these gammas. Oh, sense? I see. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's that's the different layers, isn't it? Yeah, All exactly. Independent so the n and okay. n represent different different scales, and because you only care about what happens within each scale individually, it doesn't yeah. matter when you include n n or n n. Great, thanks. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so. We, similar to what we did with band limited functions, as you see, I'm sort of repeating the story here. <clears throat> you can use the generalized sampling theorem and write a discrete equivalent for the inner product of non-band limited functions. So first, I've just replaced F and G with their sampling theorems, with their generalized sampling theorems. And just doing a little bit of algebra, you can see that the only things that fall inside the integrals are the product of the scaling functions and the product of the uh, of the wavelets. Uh, one thing to note is that as the wavelets and uh, the sync functions S have no overlap in their Fourier domain for any n, if n runs from zero to infinity, uh, their overlap will always be zero, and so you don't have to include them. So you only get overlap of the S's and overlap of the size. Now, as the wavelets and the sinks are orthogonal, we can right we can we get this when you do the actual mathematics for it and you can see that the inner product of two non-band limited functions is equal to effectively the Riemann sum of the i guess actually it's a sum of Riemann sums of 
the samples of the functions at the different scales. So you have the omega band limited components of f and g, and then the omega to the n plus one banded components of f and g at each scale n. But what it means is that the integral of any two function can be decomposed into the sums of the products of their components at each scale without cross scale terms. So you can notice that it's n, n, omega, omega, there is nothing in between. So there's no cross scale contributions to this. And that means that when we do something like scaled quantum field theory, which I'm gonna talk about now, there are a few advantages that we can notice pretty quickly from, from, from this uh, highlighted in blue equation. So first I want you again to consider the free Klein-Gordon field in one dimension, as was on the previous slide. <clears throat> We again have the creation and annihilation operator decomposition. <clears throat> but instead of band limiting the field, we just decompose it into its different scales using our wavelengths. So we just use a generalized sampling, sampling theorem. And we can see that we've decomposed the phi's into our omega band limited components on the bottom left and our scaled components on the right. And we can see that on the left, we have samples of the field. So uh, phi superscript omega sub j is equal to the evaluation of the omega band limited component of phi on a lattice of spacing delta x equals pi omega, pi divided by omega. On the right, we have an analogous thing, but it's the, it's the n banded component. So it's got an ultraviolet cutoff at two to the n plus one omega and an infrared cutoff at two to the n omega. And that is at samples are at a, on a lattice of spacing two to the negative n delta x, where again, delta x is set by the UV cutoff, oh, not by the UV cutoff, but by omega. It's not a UV cutoff anymore. But uh, the point is that sorry, look, each component of the field has a sampling lattice, uh, sampling lattice of oscillators with spacing delta x equals pi omega or two to the negative n delta x. So, <clears throat> With that, we can now do our commutation relations for this field. At different scales, we can note that the Klein-Gordon field operators always commute because there's no overlap between the scales in their Fourier components <clears throat> in their Fourier domain. And on equal scales, the commutation relations become this. So for the omega band limited component, we have again the sync function. But for the wavelet components, we have this, this I guess it's a wavelet, right? It's the difference of two sync functions. It's, our, it's the same as the psi. <clears throat> but we have a sync function scaled by two to the n plus one omega minus a sync function scaled by two to the n omega. Now note that in the limit of small delta x, both of these reduce to the standard commutation relations. <clears throat> uh, plotting this, so for the wavelet component, we can see that uh, this is non-zero for continuous separation. So at non-lattice face, non facings, this function is non-zero. But if we consider only integer multiples of our lattice facing of the, of, the, of the banded component of the field or the wavelet component of the field, <clears throat> we can see that uh, this uh, com commutation relation reduces to a Kronecker delta function. It's zero on the integers as seen in the, in the plot. Hopefully the things are big enough, but <clears throat> it's zero on the thing. So again, our wavelet component is local in if we consider only the lattice, the lattice components. So we can calculate again the Hamiltonian for such a field. Uh, we can we can deal with the Hamiltonian and we can write an equivalent discrete model, for the Hamiltonian of non-band limited Klein-Gordon fields. So we again write each field in terms of their wavelet decomposition, <clears throat> and we can decompose the Hamiltonian into its scaled components, where we have its band limited component and the scale decomposition with the wavelets. And what you might notice again, is that there are no cross terms between the scales. So this means that for each uh, component of the field, let's say phi superscript N, it is governed by a Hamiltonian only that deals with the Ns, like the, the Nth component of the Hamiltonian. So we can make a few observations. First, the full non-band limited Klein-Gordon field has this Hamiltonian, has this discrete Hamiltonian, where we have the full thing is equal to the omega band limited component plus the sum of all of the scaled components. 
the constituent band limited and scaled fields, phi omega and phi n, each have their own respective Hamiltonians that govern all of their physics, like their time evolution, their, cor their correlation functions. <clears throat> each of them is, is entirely dictated by each h. And it's these fields have no effect on those at other scales. So for instance, h of n plus one acting on phi of n would have no, no effect on phi of n and similar in any other combination. Only h of n can act on phi of n and produce any changes. So we can see that a little bit with the correlation functions of these fields. <clears throat> At each, at each scale, the field has a UV cutoff at two to the N plus one omega and an infrared cutoff at two to the N omega uh, given by this. Uh, the ground state of the two point correlation functions reflect this. So the ground state two point correlation functions for the field at each scale reflect this. So we have a UV cutoff at two to the N plus one omega, IR cutoff at two to the N omega. And due to the lack of coupling between the scales, the correlation functions between the fields at different scales is always zero. So we can write, we can write this generalized correlation functions between scales with a chronic delta between N and M in the front. Now a plot of this, so the <clears throat> ground state two-point correlation function for two fields at different positions at the same scale for N equals one and N equals two <clears throat> have been plotted. And we can note that these correlations are non-local. They have polynomial decay but they're near zero on the lattice sites. The other thing to note is that as the scale increases, so as n goes from one to two, the overall range of the correlation functions decrease, but the shape is unchanged. So even though the heights get smaller quick, more quickly in the red plot, the overall shape of the function isn't actually affected. <clears throat> and that means that the physics, even though it's scaled, it's actually, it's, it's, the physics at every scale for the field is analogous to everyone at every other scale. So I want you to recall that the band limited Klein Gordon field had a lattice model, I had an equivalent lattice model with these oscillators and springs between them with magic springs and they couple everything non locally. <clears throat> this is again a model for non locally of non locally coupled harmonic oscillators. We can do the same thing for each scaled component of the client and Gordon field at each scale, <clears throat> where each wavelet component now has an infrared cutoff as well as UV cutoff. But the spacing now between the oscillators is two to the negative n pi, pi on omega. And we again have non-local coupling between each oscillator. We again have magic springs, although slightly different magic springs. <clears throat> so this is a model of non-locally coupled harmonic oscillators with only slightly different coupling. It's not that different, but it's, it's different enough. However, we can put our models on top of each other, right? Because we have, you know, n from zero to infinity of different lattice models of for the for the scale components from this Hamiltonian. <clears throat> and we just put them all on top of each other, and the lattice spacing gets smaller and smaller for bigger n, for larger n. And we again have non-local coupling between oscillators at each scale and zero coupling between oscillators at different scales. Given again by this Hamiltonian, there are no cross terms in the total Hamiltonian. So it can just be decomposed into you know, an infinite sum of individual ones. <clears throat> so the total Hamiltonian takes into account all 1D lattices. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter if they're layered on top of each other or not, but it, it, it uses all of them. So the whole thing can be considered a single two dimensional lattice. And now our second dimension is our second discrete dimension is n now instead of just position in x and y. So <clears throat> each layer of the lattice, for each, on each lattice layer of the lattice, everything is governed by this Hamiltonian hn. Uh, nothing on any single lattice has any effect on any other lattice. And between the lattices, between the layers, sorry, physical quantities have similar forms but are scaled differently due to the scaled lattice spacing. Thus, we could consider that this two-dimensional lattice has a metric. We don't really know what this metric is yet. <clears throat> but to summarize, we have this perfect equivalence between discrete and continuous band-limited quantum field theories. <clears throat> uh, band-limited theories have an equivalent lattice theory, <clears throat> but 
but we also can decompose non-band limited fields into band limited ones using wavelets. And there is a lattice theory for each scale of the decomposition of a QFT. And thus, even if it's non-band limited, it has a lattice theory. Any QFT has a lattice theory that is just two-dimensional as opposed to one dimensional. Like it, if it's an n-dimensional QFT, then it technically, I guess, have a um, two times n-dimensional lattice model. But in one dimension, it would just have a two-dimensional lattice model. Uh, <clears throat> now, in the future, it might be possible to reinterpolate this 2D lattice model into a new 2D continuum model and perhaps figure out what metric, what associated metric such a model would have. And that's maybe something you might want to talk to Nico about for now. Uh, I think that's everything. Thank you. Everyone's going to sleep. It's very good. Thank you, Dominic. <laughs> yeah, try to unmute and get everyone back on stream. Dominic, I thought it was excellent. Thank you. And I'll refrain from further comments like hear the questions and all of that. Yeah, I have some questions. I can start unless somebody else wants to. Yep. In fact, I want to start with just uh, making sure um, they get the picture. I mean, uh, yeah, also I think that that was really excellent. So uh, thanks for putting it together in such a, a nice uh, linear form. Uh, so if you can go back to this 2D, um, 2D version, so. Um, trying to move uh, so we can see everything yeah so it's to be just the um, reinterpretation because of um the different case i didn't uh, catch that last point about the 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 second dimension where is it coming from right 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 so we can decompose the fields themselves into so if it's a continuous field if it's not band limited, you can decompose it into uh, an infinite sum of one dimensional lattice models, right? But the Hamiltonian for the total field still needs to include all of the lattice models, like all of the contributions from all of the different lattice models in, in one. And <clears throat> what you might be able to think of that is that even though these lattice models don't have any coupling between each other, you could just put them all on top of each other and then just treat it as a two-dimensional lattice model where it's like, imagine you've got, uh, you know, let's say like a, a, a line of spaghettis, right? Well, of dry spaghetti. And even though each one doesn't, uh, you know, isn't coupled to any other one, if you just lay them out next to each other, you're going to have these different layers of different lattice models that don't talk to each other, but still all contribute to the total thing as you can treat that as a two-dimensional lattice, even though at the moment there's no coupling between them. It might be that for, you know, for non-free fields, like a 5-4 interacting theory, yeah. that coupling between the lattice scales. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I, I, uh, yeah, I think I get it. Yeah, in fact, yeah, I found that the, that the separation of this case quite interesting and the, yeah, I guess that leads yeah, exactly to the question if there is some uh, uh, spatial temporal interpretation of that. So I think that, that is, that's exactly what you've been saying. But so if there is, um, so if prior to the four coupling, this would be pointwise saying the original field Hamiltonian. Um, yeah. Because then, um, okay, why I'm wondering, because the, you're, you already have a master, which is quadratic. And that follows this separation of the um, of the different uh, um, yeah this uh, the h uh, uh, to the m sum. So I wonder if there's any intuition that if you had the uh, pi to the four term, uh, why would it? Well, it might uh, break this. Is it uh, the reason the pi to the four might break this is because. <clears throat> When we first did five of the four interactions yeah. for regular band limited theories, we got uh, even more non-local behavior than just the derivative. And what this five of the four interaction would allow is if you allow leakage between the scales, so you're allowed for 
you know, the, the collision of two particles that have uh, momenta that are close to the top of the top end of the scale. So let's say two to the n plus one omega. Each one is close. If they were to combine and uh, you allowed for a uh, an interaction that created that a new particle that was the sum of those two, that would be a particle in the next scale up. And in order to be able to actually model that, you would need to have uh, cross terms between the scales. Oh, okay, uh, that's an excellent explanation because the mass term is, uh, yeah, uh, uh, doesn't change the energy essentially. Just, uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. The, okay, mass, the mass term doesn't yeah. affect you. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think I Um, I have a few questions myself. Um, you mentioned you had an interpolation function. Um, do yep. results depend on that interpolation function, or Pardon? how would, would do, results, do results depend on the interpolation function? Yes, um, yes, they do. So then, the, yeah. the choice of interpolation function, uh, we use first sync functions and then Shannon wavelets. Um, we use we make that choice initially because each of the <clears throat> Well, first, the generally has some of the simplest mathematics associated with them. But also, in the Fourier domain, these interpolation functions are just box functions with no overlap in them between the scales. So depending on the choice of, of interpolation function, you're going to either have no interaction, like no cross terms between the scales, or very small cross terms. <clears throat> and it's just by the choice of our interpolation function that we have no cross terms between the scales. But it means that by choice of interpolation function, you can decompose a continuous free field into um, decoupled lattices. So you've got, you've got some freedom there in, in what to choose, basically. Um, yes. Okay. And uh, another question is, um, in, in the context of sampling, do you have to be worried about artifacts? Like, I immediately think of the, Gib the Gibbs phenomenon, um, for example. Do we have to be worried about anything like that here? Uh, I'm actually not sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, technically, yes. It's something similar to the Gibbs phenomenon does appear, and that's the oscillations you see in the, for example, the correlation functions when you cut off, the, when you put in a UV cutoff. It's a similar effect. You yeah, get additional oscillations between the sampling points. So you could argue that's sort of a Gibbs phenomenon. Thank you. Okay. So I've got a question, Dominic. Yep. I mean, obviously I'm familiar with this work, um, but where do you see the, what's, what's next? Um, what are the open problems or what are the things, is there something that's obvious to do next um, and you think you can do it? Is there something that's obviously yeah. a roadblock that we'd have to look at? Just let's look forward a bit and then yeah. um, extrapolate uh, for what, where we might go with this work. Yeah. Uh, well, the immediate next step to me would be to introduce some sort of, uh, like I said to Magdalena, some sort of interaction term that allows for coupling between the scales. So for instance, <clears throat> What we could do now is blindly treat each scale as layered on top of the next one and then try to interpolate between them and use that to define correlation functions between the scales and figure out what a metric is, like what sort of metric would be associated with this lattice decomposition in 2 plus 1d. That's something that Nico's working on at the moment. However, if we first introduce some sort of interaction that like interaction to the field that gives us coupling between the scales, it like some sort of coupling between the scales, it might give us some sort of insight as to how we should be orienting these scales, like these different lattice theories on top of each other. Because it might not be that, for instance, in the diagram that I've got shown, each one is just layered one over the other. The, de the, the density of the oscillators uh, increases for, uh, in terms of the number of oscillators increases as and goes up, so you have more smaller and smaller scaling. But it might be that uh, the actual geometry of our two plus one dimensional field has, you know, some sort of offset on each of the scales. And I think that uh, introducing some sort of thing that 
gives us an insight as to how that layering looks maybe with an interaction term would be a decent next step. Yeah, that, that sounds good. What about um, do, what about the the continuous wavelet? Like, as I, I'm sorry, the continuous um, <clears throat> Shannon wavelets as a uh, as an overcomplete basis, where you let the scale not just be an in, the, the the exponent two to the n be something non-integer. Because we talked about yes. that in the meeting with the <clears throat> Yes, folks. yes, yes. Well, that that's that's another thing, right? So <clears throat> you could just either let you know, the n be non-integer or equivalently do some sort of, maybe not equivalently, but also, or do some sort of interpolation between the scales, between the ends. And, you know, that would be another way to get a continuous theory, like a continuous two plus one dimensional theory from our, yeah, yeah. Um, our free field. But yeah, nice. I, I, to be honest, I, I still think it would, might still be more beneficial to first look at what sort of, like, between scale coupling that an interacting theory before you know, blindly choosing. Hang on, Nico is being very distracting with fart like sounds. Um, oh. <laughs> um, so, Dominic, can you just say that last bit again? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you think about what, you know, just letting n be a real number do, does or um, uh, interpolating between the ends, is you're going to have this sort of. Uh, I don't, can't really draw it, but you're going to have this idea that as n increases, you're sort of just going vertically up the scales in a, in a picture that might be yeah. a little bit similar to the one that I've got on the screen, but you've just got extra stuff in the middle that we don't really know what it is yet, right? And it's some sort of, yeah. you know, different, these different lattice models that, you know, look maybe funny. However, it might be that when we, you know, have some sort of interaction term in the lattice models or in the continuum that is sampled onto the lattices, it might, you know, tell us that maybe the the third point on you know the, on the bottom layer is actually best connected with the I don't know eighth point on the next one, and it might tell us something about how we actually want to orient our lattices and where we want to like how we want to have them layered on top of each other before interpolating between them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So here, yeah, all right. So here's an example. If you let n be not just integers, but half integers, then I believe what you're doing is you're mapping omega. I'm sorry, not, okay. You let n be all half integers. So like uh, one half, three halves, five halves, um, odd half integers, I guess you could call them. Um, and so that would be in, in between what we have, but that could be rescaled you could rescale omega so that n is back on the integers. And I think that would be an omega rescaling by root two. Yeah. And so it would be the same picture, just with a different scaling. So it, it, it seems to me that every possible um, uh, regular spacing, uh, you know, you can rescale the integers to anything that you want, and you'll get a regular spacing yes. in which there's, there's this independence. Yeah, or, or, as you said, all you're doing is um, <clears throat> uh, scaling omega itself. Right, but of course, if you compare Either translating or scaling yeah. omega. Yes, but of course, if you compare the integer scales to the odd half integer scales, then there will be some overlap because those wavelets are not orthogonal. Yes. So they're each they're each orthogonal in the, within their own domain, but not between domains. Um, that has the flavor of a Shannon sampling theorem or Shannon reconstruction, where you've got um, you've got no connection between, no overlap between the the sync functions at different integers. But as soon as you go to something that's off that integer lattice, there is some overlap. Yes. But you can yes. shift that lattice to whatever you want. Yes. So I'm, yeah, anyway, I kind of hijacked this to talk through this idea. So uh, maybe we can talk about it later. But anyway, I, I find this really interesting, this, this question of interpolation or making the basis over complete and really connecting those two concepts. Yeah, I, I think I have sort of this sort of plot where if you were just shift off the integers, you would have <clears throat> non-zero 
coupling between the lattices. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we should probably talk about, talk about that at some point. And yeah, that sounds good. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yep. Uh, so can you connect this uh, different scale wavelet quantum field theory to uh, renormalization flow? Um, probably not without bullshit. I'm not sure. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it it is a type of renormalization. Yes. Not exactly Wilsonian RG, but it is um, it is an RG flow. Okay. Thank you. Nico is happy to bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that that that's a joke. I mean, I I. I Yes, I respect you have actual thoughts on this, Nico. I'm not trying to <laughs> deride you. Uh, I believe there is a different choice of wavelet if you want to do an exact Wilson renormalization. Uh, can you repeat that, Nico? Is it a bit muffled? There, there, um, I, I, I seem to recall reading that uh, if you choose a different wavelet, not Shannon, but it, I can't remember which one it was, but there is a different wavelet choice you can make and you get Wilson renormalization renormalization group flows as you move up the scales or down the scales. Yeah. So we have talked about this in, in terms of just scale invariance because with a free field, a massless free field will be scale invariant. Um, and so if you, uh, and that's, that's shown because if you rescale the x-axis, then that's equivalent to moving either up or down the list of no, the, 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 the layers. Yes, and that's what this slide on the correlation functions was talking about. So right. the, the shape of the correlations is unaffected by the scale. It's just, you know, all you'd ha really have to do is plot these on two different plots, one with x minus, like with the x-axis scaled by to the negative n, and they would be identical in shape and range. Right, got it. Yeah. So can you guys repeat what, uh, what makes this uh, um... Uh, running of this case equivalent to the renormalization? Is it the choice of the wavelets? Did I get it right? I think I couldn't. Okay. Yes, uh, it's the choice of the wavelet. But it doesn't seem to change much of the physics of the model. So would it be, I mean, should one expect that the different choices give rise to some different type of renormalization, or is it uh, uh, is it really so fixed that only one choice has any relation with that? Because it still will move the um, uh, kind of sweep through energy scales, which kind of intuitively seem the, the relevant bit for the renormalization group. But uh, yeah, maybe that simple uh, picture misses something. No, you're right. Um, different choices of wavelets will give you the result of different um, variations on the renormalization group, but they will all have the characteristic that as you change the scale, you will see the basic physics behavior at that scale. Um, one thing that Shannon Wavelets has in particular, which is um, rather special is the fact that it specifically has no correlations between scales, whereas other wavelets Okay. will have correlations between scales. And so that's just a, a, an observation which can have um, consequences, um, but it's still, it is a, it is a renormalization group flow of sorts. Mm -hmm. cool. You know, if there is anyone doing uh, 
some regular scattering, textbook scattering problems with the with this method just to see how this works. If there is some what type of scattering? Stuff. Yeah, just any any really any textbook example where one renormalizes the vertex, some phi to the three or something with this method, so one can see how this works, or is it uh, an ongoing research just to I would be curious to just have a look at the if there is any anything like that just out of curiosity. That would be a good idea. Um, we haven't got to that yet. Yeah. This is a little bit still new for us. And so then the relation between the uh, renormalization group and, and this uh, and the wavelet. So I understood that this can be established by someone else, or is it an observation that comes from you guys and it's just not in any paper yet? It's been done by, it, it's been done with somebody, somebody else has done it for different wavelets in the context of um, ADS-CFT. Oh, okay, yeah, so that's. So Gavin's an expert in this. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, he's the one who got us into wavelets at all. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're addicted. Um, First one's free. Um, so he would be a better person to talk about this because he's written papers on use of wavelets in QFT before. Um, the, our reason for doing Shannon wavelets is to connect to what uh, Dominic uh, has has done before, what we've done before in this group, which is band-limited QFT. Yeah. yeah. 